More food for thought is our guest speaker this morning, it's Dr. Tanya Duty, who joins us uh, this week as uh, part of a CSIRO, CDU, um, aquatic postgraduate, sorry, postdoctoral fellowship that we have where we have jointly appointed four postdocs, uh, thanks to our friends at CSIRO, uh, and focused on riparian and aquatic sciences. And RAF is one of those. Put your hand up, RAF. Thank you very much. Who works on uh, remote sensing and LIDAR, with a focus on aquatic ecosystems, or, or, or in this case, potentially groundwater dependent ecosystems. So introducing Tanya's career, she's been with Sara for 30 years, an heroic achievement. She's still smiling. Apparently she plays the clarinet, I believe. When she says mental health day kicks in, so, but she's still with us. And she's um, one of Australia's leading scientists uh, who are uh, working on uh, tree transpiration, dynamics of tree water use across uh, the, the landscapes. She's now focused in the north, which is fantastic. So we're trying to engineer some collaborative work in North Australia, where we're going to be looking at um, the impacts of, I guess, uh, we can look at the impacts of climate change, uh, in this case, dependence on groundwater uh, and tree water use in, in sensitive parts of the landscape, mainly the riparian zone. And Jenny's now waving at us as well. You may. We haven't even opened our gobs yet. Okay, who's going to run a competition on that one? I National Park, greatest two for dam in the world. Very good. Well, maybe that's a good segue to get started on the seminar. But uh, that's what we're going to hear about is groundwater dependent ecosystems through the lens of um, the tree, tree component and how, how reliable, reliant are trees on this resource or not. So I'm going to hand it over. I believe I give that to our speaker. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming along today. Uh, and what I've, I've said to, to Raf and Lindsay is that, for me, presentations are all about the photos. So most of these photos are ones that I've taken from different places, predominantly in Australia, but in, in other areas around the world. But also just wanted to be able to communicate through photos how beautiful groundwater dependent ecosystems are and how diverse and it helps to understand what they are so it, they, they, there's just so many of them around the world so today is really just an overview of groundwater dependency ecosystems and i will go to gdes because it's just too hard to keep saying um, and their importance particularly in the ecosystem world which is where i work so what are GDEs? Well, they're natural ecosystems. They are occurring, as I said, around the globe, but they're in the areas where the ecosystems are using groundwater to support some or all of their life history traits and to maintain ecosystem function and also biodiversity. So one of the key points here is that GDEs are not particularly vegetation, which is my perspective today, are not 100% reliant on groundwater. GDEs could use groundwater for two days a year over their life history. That makes them a GDE. GDEs are also springs, rivers, wetlands, but they're also the species that are transient in and out of those GDE systems. So if we're thinking about uh, an aquatic GDE, we might have birds that are migratory. They might come in, stay for a few days and fly on to the north or further beyond. Those birds are also groundwater dependent. And that's a bit of the story that most people kind of don't understand so much. They're more focused on what is fixed in the landscape. So there's three types of groundwater dependent ecosystems. And as I mentioned, these are some of the photos, uh, particularly, I'll use the mouse here, these ones over here are from the Murray-Darling Basin um, and are around my field sites in South Australia and Victoria and New South Wales. But there are three sorts of GDEs. So we have a surface expression of groundwater, and that's where we have wetlands and springs and seeps where groundwater is coming to the surface and we can see the groundwater. Uh, it also includes river base flow. So a river might ha have uh, surface water in it, but it's also got a groundwater component feeding into it. And a classic example of that is the Murray-Darling Basin system and particularly the Murray River. There's a significant amount of groundwater that flows into the Murray. 
Um, and that's pretty much what kept it sustained through the Millennium Drought. Um, and as I said, terrestrial fauna are a part of that surface expression of groundwater. Then we have the subsurface expression of groundwater. And this is where we have vegetation that is accessing groundwater either directly into the groundwater, and I'll show how that can happen later, but via the soil as well. And then there's the probably the more difficult to measure is the aquifer and cave ecosystems where we have Steiger fauna um, and their little microorganisms that float around or swim around in cave systems in the water, but also troglofauna, which live above the water um, in the air spaces of caves that obviously are relying on that water. A classic GDE in South Australia are these giant cuttlefish. So these occur and they come in and breed in the estuarine zone, um, I think it's through June and July. And there's fresh up water welling mixing with the, the marine ground, uh, the marine water. Um, and so that's really important, that mixing of groundwater and marine water to support the uh, life cycle of that cuttlefish. So what is groundwater dependency? Well, it's where the plants and animals, as I was mentioning before, they rely on that access to groundwater at some stages of their life just to persist. So most of Australia is arid and semi-arid. And so where you're seeing trees along creeks and rivers, um, springs and, and animals, you can guarantee there is some form generally of groundwater. And that groundwater is often recharged by the more um, flat, flashy systems, particularly up north of rainfall. So we have big rainfall, monsoon, and that will drain down into those groundwater systems and recharge them. And that will help to then sustain vegetation and animals um, through dry periods. That's sort of the northern situation, a little bit different in the south. And really important in the south, really important for us in terms of drought. So um, again, the Murray-Darling Basin, our tree species down there are groundwater dependent. And even though water, groundwater is super hypersaline, I'll show an example where the trees did use groundwater through the drought to um, sustain themselves. So what are the impacts of altered groundwater availability? So impacts occur from the diversion essentially of surface water from land use change, uh, weed infestation like weeping willows in the in the southern areas of South Australia and Victoria and New South Wales are really important weed infestation, uh, pollution and disease. What this does, it, it, it creates changes in health. Uh, it can affect the aerial extent of vegetation, for example, or springs. If we're extracting water for mining, strings, springs might shrink because that water is being pumped out. Um, it impacts ecosystem elements or asset recruitment. And this all impacts on ecosystem structure. And if we're really unfortunate, leads to entire ecosystem collapse, which has happened um, across Australia many times. Uh, so the reasons for some of this is really uh, humans and development. So it is irrigated agriculture, plantation forestry, which I'll provide an example of after the mining, dewatering, uh, drought and human consumption. So over the past 20 years, Australia have really led the way in understanding what groundwater dependent ecosystems are and how we might manage them. So I've fortunately been a part of that journey for probably the last 15 years, especially. Uh, but what's more exciting is watching the rest of the world now follow our lead and seeing America particularly have a huge emphasis on GDEs. China are beginning to as well. Um, and they're doing this because in Australia, we've determined that we need to protect these areas because they're providing habitat. They're sustaining bi biodiversity, also ecosystem functions. Uh, across Australia particularly, some of these GDEs, particularly springs, sustain Indigenous communities or the rivers are sustaining vegetation, which Indigenous communities might use for food or fibre sources. Um, and of course, the, the protection is really to prevent that ecosystem collapse uh, and also species extinction. So this is a spring that was actually taken up around Darwin a few years ago, I, th I think, which is actually one of my favourite photos. Uh, 
So I'll just run through briefly some of the characteristics of the different types of GDEs that I talked about. So here we have a couple of conceptual models of, and this is the subsurface ex surface expression of groundwater. And so this is the, the situation where vegetation particularly are supported by groundwater. So what happens is that we have groundwater, obviously then we have the soil um, and we have that capillary fringe of soil that sits above the groundwater. So an important factor here is rooting depth of the trees and the depth to groundwater. So if vegetation, and, and there's a rule of thumb, which is really rubbery, if vegetation have tree roots down to about 10 metres, you can pretty much assume that at some point they will be accessing groundwater, but that is so dependent on soil type particularly. So if you've got a sandy soil, that could easily be 20 metres. If you've got a thick clay, it might only be two or three metres of rooting depth for those trees to be able to access groundwater. Um, the groundwater for the vegetation provides nutrient sources, but also uh, the vegetation itself provides refuges. And uh, as I was mentioning, the Murray-Darling Basin, particularly through the millennium drought, provided a critical water source to maintain our really poor conditioned trees. So it didn't help them look any better. They still declined, but it actually still just managed to keep them alive. Uh, the photo over here is in Yanga National Park in New South Wales during the 2010 to 2012 flood period. Um, and that was watching a, a floodplain come back to life after severe drought. Then we have the surface expression of groundwater and that's where groundwater is welling up. So some examples over here again of the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, these birds here, again, they're groundwater dependent because they're relying on the habitat provided by these lakes and upwelling of water. So the groundwater, again, it provides support to aquatic biodiversity, which isn't always the case for the, the vegetation, which is that subsurface. So it's a source of water, particularly when surface water has become um, low. Uh, and I think that's definitely a situation up in the north during the dry period where you might get pools of upwelling groundwater. And it also actually helps to regulate water quality and temperature by, by mixing the surface flows and the groundwater flows. Some examples of surface expressions of groundwater, which can be absolutely stunning. So over here, this is a thermal system in um, the South Island of New Zealand. So over in this uh, sand is thermal hot water welling up. So you can dig a hole and sit in a warm bath while you've got your feet in the cold ocean. But that thermal upwelling is groundwater and that's been demonstrated. This is a wetland that I worked in down on the Nepal and Indian border called Koshi Tapu Wildlife Reserve. Again, through the dry period, this water here is upwelling groundwater. Um, so all the vegetation here is sustained by groundwater. Um, again, this is Chitwan actually came up yesterday in conversation. Again, in Nepal, a beautiful river there, which is groundwater fed. So again, just trying to stimulate some of that attraction of why GDEs are important through photos. Um, here is the aquifer and cave GDEs. And I know Jenny's quite across this and is probably well aware of this photo, in fact. <laughs> um, so we do a bit of research in collaboration with Jenny uh, and CSIRO up in the north in the Beetaloo area. And this is a photo where a fishing rod was used in a, a bore to see if we could catch some snowga fauna, which we did manage to do quite well. More excitingly, uh, this year, cameras were put down some of these bores and we have some amazing footage of different steiger fauna swimming around through cave systems, all really important in terms of um, ensuring these ecosystems are protected as a result of development up in the north and down in the south. Again, just some photos here to, to stimulate you know, an appreciation of, of why GDEs are, are really important. Uh, it, yeah, a lioness in Africa next to a spring. Uh, these are flamingos. Again, I think that was Namibia. Uh, again, groundwater fed areas. The springs of a to Tosha Pan, also groundwater fed. So these areas we are all aware of around the world, 
are really important groundwater dependent ecosystems and the fauna. So the giraffe require the water, the elephants require the water. These are a floodplain vegetation down south. Uh, swans, again, this is Yanga National Park in New South Wales after the big floods of 2010 to 2012. These swans went through three breeding cycles um, because there was that real boom due to flooding. So there's some key char characteristics of GDEs which we really have to investigate to try and work out and understand what is a GDE and how do we start to manage them. I won't labour this at all, but as I mentioned, depth to groundwater is really important in terms of tree species and understanding if they can access groundwater and that's in relation to unconfined aquifers, uh, discharge of the groundwater as well or the, the pressure and that's important also for springs, the rate and volume of groundwater supply or that flux, but also particularly in the cave and aquifer systems, uh, water quality is really important as it is for rivers and streams as well. So there's different dependencies, levels of dependencies on groundwater and it extends from down in this area, which, oh, I can read here. Uh, if we've got a creek here, for example, or a river or a spring, the vegetation within that riparian zone might be 100% reliant on groundwater. But as you move away from the water source and as you bring in elevation and depth to water table increases, groundwater dependent ecosystems, particularly vegetation, will rely less on that groundwater, but it does still support their life history. And so we can have highly groundwater dependent, proportional groundwater dependence where the, you know, the, the amount that groundwater declines is the proportion of availability of water for those trees, right out to the, uh, the outer extent here where the vegetation are only reliant on rainfall. And there are some techniques that I'll talk about in a minute that help us to determine where on this gradient, uh, particularly vegetation might be sitting. So what are the knowledge gaps in groundwater dependent ecosystem management? Over the last 10 years, particularly, there's been a huge expansion in how to map GDEs. Uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of that journey. Um, for me, it's all around multiple lines of evidence as well to inform that mapping. So in 2010, the Australian government funded the GDE Atlas, which is an online national atlas mapping of groundwater dependent ecosystems, particularly the surface and the subsurface GDEs. However, you know, there were some serious constraints about creating that atlas and it's a first stop as a tool. So if you're a mining company and you want to understand if there's GDEs in your area, say vegetation, you'd go to the atlas. They're really big polygons of vegetation, but it might give you a, you know, there is high possibility of GDEs. So when we're talking about mapping, we actually need to be thinking across scales. If it's, if it's a mining concern, start at the groundwater dependent ecosystem, like the GD Atlas, which is really broad. That might say, yes, there's GDEs, but then you have to go to more local studies and more local remote sensing and bringing in multiple lines of evidence. And that can be geology, rainfall, depth to groundwater, um, a whole swathe of information. Um, and this is a PhD student who finished last year. Uh, outback South Australia, very little information, very few bores. Uh, and he developed a method to map GDEs just using online available data. So the intent there was that people who want to do risk assessments to map GDEs knew what data was available online to try and bring that information, the multiple lines of evidence together, together to identify where GDEs are. The big problem with the mapping is there is generally very little field validation that occurs to say that there are actual GDEs there. They're not quantified. We're just using a lot of methods to say, look, you know, we, we think there's GDEs there. The other biggest problem, which we're starting to, to address more significantly now, and there's been two journal papers in the last year come out, is that we don't understand the water requirements of the GDEs. And if we're thinking vegetation, which is how I think generally, when do they need water? How much water do they use? How often do they use water? And so we're talking about timing, magnitude and duration of groundwater use. 
So there are significant broad scale knowledge gaps in that area. So I'll give a, this is one example of um, GDE mapping, which actually was an, um, one area was done up here in the north and then one of these field sites was down in South Australia. And this one's giving a good example of how the GDE Atlas over here is in the black gives a, a broad overview of where GDEs might be, um, and that's the red areas. But then we've brought in much finer resolution remote sensing imagery, which is radar, to identify more, you know, down to five metre resolution where groundwater dependent ecosystems might be. So it's this example of using broad scale, local and regional studies to then zone down and, and understand where the GDEs might be. Again, there is a lack of field validation around these methods, which I can't say enough. How do we determine the GDE water requirements? And some of that work has been up, done up here. I've undertaken some of these methods down in the south, which I'll give examples of. But we can use isotopes. And I know we have some isotope fans in the room, which is fantastic because it's super important. <laughs> We can do field water balance measurement studies, uh, predominantly using sap flow sensors, but flux towers as well. Uh, groundwater samples, understanding, you know, taking those samples from bores, which I showed before. Groundwater flux studies, so over time, looking at how groundwater might fluctuate in relation to vegetation evapotranspiration. This has occurred back in the 70s in plantation forestry. Uh, also direct qualitative field observations. So I heard, a, a, I guess, an anecdote out of uh, the States where one of my colleagues uh, has long-term data in a, a semi-arid catchment and trees are deciduous. So the trees lost their leaves. There was no rainfall, but river flow returned into a dry system. Uh, so that's indicating pretty strongly that those trees were groundwater dependent ecosystems, they lost their leaves and allow groundwater to rise and come back into sort of that base flow situation. Uh, and then we have leaf water potential, which is a great indicator of tree water stress as well. So obviously the less stressed the trees are, the higher chance that they're using groundwater if there's no surface water around. So a couple of examples. This is a, a site I'm still walk, working at in South Australia. It, it's called Book Penong. The reason for doing this study is quite unique in that uh, this was through the peak of the millennium drought. This is the River Murray in the blue here, uh, super hyper saline groundwater. And what we did was put a bore, uh, salt interception scheme bores, which you might not be aware of, but very important in the Murray-Darling Basin to stop saline groundwater getting into the Murray. But we used one of those bores to actually create a freshwater lens pulling water from the Murray right through to these bores. So the trees were desperate for a fresh water source. So we undertook some sap flow sensor studies. We measured groundwater depth and salinity. We used isotopes and pre dawn water potentials. And whilst you won't be able to read these graphs here, we had three tree species. And from a combination of those multiple lines of evidence, we could clearly identify that those trees were using groundwater. That was really important coming from isotope studies were critical for that one, but it was supported by the fact that the trees had less water stress through pre dawn water potential, and we could see the change in water use via sap flow. So there's that multiple lines of evidence to try and understand uh, where GDEs are. Sap flow also gives us the ability to start looking at magnitude of water use and the timing. And that is this study here. So this is Mount Gambier plantation forestry. Uh, the forests themselves were groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, whilst they're, they're man-made, the study was to try and understand for state government, how much water were the plantations extracting from groundwater so that water licensing and extraction uh, policy could be instigated in that region, which was the outcome of this research. But a flow on effect of, of these plantations that were using groundwater is that wetlands that were GDEs in the region were beginning to decline as well. So the extent of the, the springs were decreasing because groundwater was going out through the trees. 
again, in this study, we use sat flow sensors, soil evaporation, canopy interception, rainfall. Uh, more importantly was soil moisture measurements every three, three to four weeks using a hydroprobe. Uh, we measured 30 centimetre increments down to the groundwater and that allowed us to marry up, okay, when were the trees using groundwater? How much were they using throughout the year? And we could um, quantitatively determine a percentage of groundwater use. Again, this table is very difficult to read, but over here, what we can show is that, um, you know, this tree species, 1100 millimetres of evapotranspiration we measured from the trees, but by bringing in the soil moisture data, we could quantify that 400 or nearly half of that water use came from the groundwater. And when we go back to the three weekly or monthly data, we can start looking at when they use groundwater and how much, what were the important months. Um, and that's indicated in another graph that's coming up soon. Another method, which I was telling Lindsay about over dinner the other night was for fun, we went and put sap flow sensors in tree roots in a cast cave in Mount Gambia. Groundwater was at 14 metres and we could see these tree roots in the groundwater. We also put sap flow sensors in the stem of the tree and what we were able to do was identify that of the stems and the roots we measured, at least 22% of the water that that tree was using came directly from the groundwater. So these are the sort of quantitative indications even that species are groundwater dependent. That I think most of these are also published studies. So um, you'll be able to have a look at the, the PowerPoint for those links as well. And again, as I was talking about that plantation data, that's, I think it's like 24 sites. Some of our field sites go for five years of continuous sat flow data, three to six weekly measurements. We're starting to use that now to help us bring in models that might so the, the field data is trying to help validate models that are going to help us understand the water requirements of vegetation GDEs. So again, the how much, how often and when. Um, so watch this space around that. It's, it's very early days, um, but that's been kind of fun so far. Uh, the graph over here is actually demonstrating when the trees were using groundwater uh, and over this particular year, it was during the summer months in the Mount Gambia region, which can be quite warm and dry. And that's pretty much it for now. Again, another fantastic groundwater, uh, GDE after flood. Um, but hopefully you've got a flavour of what GDEs are and why they're important and why you know, we need to keep continuing to measure, monitor uh, and quantify where they are. <laughs> Given your experience in Murray Darling Basin, and I've been following things from afar, mm -hmm. um, and there's you know there's now um, environmental water that's being delivered down mm -hmm. river courses to wetlands. Um, do you see any acknowledgement at all about how that might you know about delivering groundwater? in some way or is just that surface water being delivered going to help or yeah interestingly enough there's not much focus on groundwater in the Murray Darling Basin so in some instances the surface water will help to recharge some of those lake areas and if I think about the Renmark region where I'm working a really sandy site black box trees very poor health uh, environmental flow will come into that lake and sit on top of the saline groundwater. So really, really critically important to support those GDEs with groundwater. On the whole, the amount of water we can deliver for environmental flows is really quite small and it's very constrained by the infrastructure that occurs throughout the basin. So at the moment, it's we're, we're in this amazing situation where we've had a massive, massive, massive flood that flood will restore groundwater freshness for probably support the next the trees for the next five years at least. Yeah. Um, so environmental flow is a part of the story, but because of the constraints of delivery of that water and the volumes of water, 
Um, it's more for triage of really high ecological value areas in some instances and fringing vegetation. What was your second question? Well, if no one else no, wants to right. no, 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 um, I spent many years working on urban wetlands in Perth, mm -hmm. which are, you know, part of that sand, their water is coming from that sandy, unconfined um, aquifer mm -hmm. below the Perth. Uh, Swan Coastal Plain, and I used to go to lots of meetings where we would talk about protecting the wetlands and having boundaries, but those boundaries, you know, to map out the wetland were always based on the um, terrestrial catchment, and we would sit there and say, but, you know, the, the, the aquifer that supports these um, wetlands should be protected as well, because that was yes. in the too hard basket, because it was a much bigger area, and no one was going to stop development. Yeah, and so... Scale. That's actually been the focus of a review paper, groundwater review paper led by Peter Cook. I think we published it early this year. So one of our biggest knowledge gaps across Australia is the network of bores, groundwater bores. So we can start to get a handle on where is the groundwater, how much groundwater is there. Um, so it's still an absolute struggle to manage these aquifers. Yeah. Well, people are drawing the, you know, things totally on terrestrial yeah. surface. Which, surface. Yeah. yeah, and the terrestrial is constrained. It's just because there's no vegetation doesn't mean there's not groundwater, uh, but the soil may not support the, the terrestrial species. A talk with us, which I guess, um, the findings are unsurprising and conclusions are unsurprising, but great to have numbers and, you know, something definite to hand to people. Um, but, you know, in a country where there's been bores since, since Australia started or since it was colonised and uh, where mine tailings are, are obviously polluting groundwater in, in places, I was wondering about where's this gonna go? And you mentioned your models at the end. I wonder what your vision, vision is for how those models, what they're gonna be and how, how they'll be applied or be useful. Yeah, it's a great question actually, because it's that understanding the water requirements is our biggest challenge. And I'm very much of the, we have to take a pragmatic approach. So as scientists, we can often say, oh no, that's not gonna work. It's gonna to be too inaccurate. But my approach is generally a bit different. It's like, yeah, acknowledge that. Because if we don't give it a go, we're, not, we're still not going to have any tools to do this. So I think one of the unique situations for me is this data set that we collected in Mount Gambia that's going to be really instrumental in, to, in developing these tools. These tools can also then be scaled up with remote sensing. So I'm, we're trying to work, work with models that have evapotranspiration, climate factors, anything we can get from remote sensing layers so we can convert the model to remote sensing data inputs and then remote sensing data outputs. That will give us an idea of the, you know, at, for quite some time, they're going to be really um, caveat laden estimates of when and where trees might be using groundwater for any sort of management. Richard. Yes, you're up. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, more interesting than what you can see, particularly when you show the SAR GDE. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, SAR has got this great potential where, you know, it's still able to see through the cloud to get images and, you know, providing great data. So I just want to know with that, is it a published paper? And do you know what kind of SAR data that was used? You have an idea about yes, that? Yes, yeah. and yes. <laughs> right, yes, okay. it is a published paper. Okay. Um, and the, the reference was in the slide, okay. but yeah, flick me an email if you need. Um, and it was Sentinel SAR okay. data. Thank you. Yeah. We did that a couple of years ago now. Um, and I should say, too, for SAR was really revolutionary because in the past we used Landsat and we all know, particularly up here, clouds are a problem. So SAR has been fantastic to help us to start identify GDEs up here. Yes, at the professional level, where I know we've got models that we can upscale and, you know, every yep. night, yeah, 
more robust and reliable, then yeah, I think the SARA is, is going to be very useful. It's useful as a line of evidence, yeah. definitely. And I have to stress, no one technique is the answer. Uh, the GD Atlas was multiple lines of evidence and that was the emphasis of that paper for me. Someone is asking us uh, the base question on the first slide. Report. Oh, the front screen. Where was the slide? The first slide. Your first photo. When we started the presentation. Yeah, that was in Lawn Hill in oh, Queensland. Oh, yep. Lawn yes, Lawn Hill National Park, Park which is absolutely stunning. stunning. <laughs> Fortunate enough to do a lot of fall driving in Outback Australia, so I get to these places. I hope that's very good. Lawn Hill National Park. It's, it's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. I've got a quick question. Do we still have time? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Just wondering, um, how do these remote sensing-based um, evapotranspiration estimates compare to your sat flow measurements? I don't know if you've done any sort of comparison, because I always wonder how good, reliable these ones good are. Good question. So we actually published a paper this year uh, using Murray-Darling Basin data initially. So uh, I think we had 10 field plots uh, ET measured every three to six weeks. And we use that field data to bias correct the turn ET product for that more regional area of the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, so we got really good uh, agreement of outputs. I think we had R squares of 0.93 between field data and the bias corrected outputs that we had created. Uh, we also then moved that technique to the Mount Gambia plantation forestry as well. Um, so, you know, the turn ET data set is absolutely fantastic, national, um, and what we've learned over years, and it's, you know, worldwide, it's a common thing, to use it at more local scales, it is better if you have got local field data, just to provide that bias cre uh, correction in terms of climate, particularly. And if you compare to SAPFLOW data? Yeah. Yeah. So you have to bear in mind that sap flows transpiration, yeah. uh, whereas these products are evapotranspiration. Yeah. Um, and so particularly in the Murray-Darling Basin, transpiration might only be 10% of evapotranspiration. Uh, that right? Could be, yeah. Because we'd be in the dry, yeah. very slight. You can saw evaporation so much. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Most shrubs are physiologically normal. Yeah. Yeah. As you go south, yeah. Very different systems. So through the peak of the drought in 2007 and 8 at Bukpanong, the black box trees, which are not so much riparian zone, a bit more dry land, they were using. 0.001 millimetres per day yeah. of water because it's hypersaline. There was no rainfall, hypersaline water. So yeah. that's what I mean that, you know, even though the groundwater was super, super saline, the trees could still use it to some extent by filtering there. They have adaptations to allow them to use enough, but their condition just declined to have just a few twigs <laughs> by the end. The place? Uh, South Australia. No. Yes. But again, the trees down there are really adapted to floods. So it's a dynamic flood drought kind of system. And when floods come through, those trees do have an ability to, to flush again. And it would take decades to become really, really good and healthy after such drought, but they do have an ability to improve. Uh, <laughs> I've just been polite letting everyone else go. Um, thanks, Tony. That was awesome. Um, I think one thing for me, I'm going to steal um, part of your talk, which is one of the things that I find is, I don't know which one's more, that most people either don't understand or don't care about groundwater or both, but then um, making that point about, oh, those birds over there, groundwater dependent. You know, it, I think it's, yeah, just a, another way of thinking about it. Someone that studies these things, but on the sort of more on the groundwater side, I'd, I've never thought about it that way. Um, but the question that I had, um, particularly because some of us around here at the moment are thinking about climate adaptation, mm. I really liked the, the salt interception um, scheme story. 
Could you see that as being something that might be investigated if flooding is going to be less frequent in the area and there are trees that sort of need that flush occasionally to, to literally ramp up the, the pump, uh, yeah, the salt interception schemes to draw temporarily water from the river to sort of sustain the trees in the floodplains, I mean? <laughs> That's a really tough question because it's, it's the money involved to do that. So... I think it would then come back to a priority situation of what's the ecological value of that system. And so if it's deemed high enough and the funds are there, then there are techniques that work. So there's that pulling of the groundwater, creating a freshwater lens, essentially. Uh, managed aqua for re recharge is also being seen as an option in investigating through Southern Australia. Um, I've got another paper out there where we, <laughs> we use drip irrigation so uh, the floodplain was in between a vineyard that was drip irrigated and the river. So the, um, the vineyard owner donated the water and all the infrastructure for us to set up drip irrigation across different flow regimes so we could understand how the water responded, uh, how the trees responded to different amounts of water. So there are methods that we could use. Salt interception is probably one of the most expensive but if you want to put in a bore just to create that drag, yeah, it's yeah. probably an option. It's more the technique. I mean, we've been yeah. talking about um, uh, what options do you have, and it just seems like that's something where, yeah, something designed for something else, but you can change the way that they that you use it if there's trees that you really decide need to. It, yeah. it really worked. I think, uh, again, there's a journal paper, and I think the freshwater lens ended up, or oh, top of my head, three metres thick. Uh, out to about 100 metres from the river's edge. So it was really successful in, in creating that freshwater lens. But, of course, it's very localised. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Any others? Actually, I'll just throw in there too. I gave pretty much this talk to Flinders Uni last week or week before, and they made the same observation that people don't think about the species that are coming and going mm -hmm. as GDEs. Um, they just see what's there, what's stationary, and that's what they are. So it's really good that people are starting to pick up that when I say that, it is a lot more dynamic um, than we would otherwise think. It's not just the trees. It's the whole, so I've seen it's that the whole the ecosystem. Well, I've heard too, the term the to the groundwater dependent the vegetation, and then there's groundwater dependent the ecosystem, which is in fauna as well as the flora. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the plant nerds just think of the whole deal as a whole bunch of trees you've got to worry about. So not so much more happens. The soaks, the streams, the yeah. birds, the whole, and I thought that was another great thing to report. So I thought it was terrific. And that the emphasis well. of that for me has actually my thinking's grown there, and it's come out of a, a massive project uh, program around environmental flows in the Murray Darling Basin called Flow Mur, funded by the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, and so it's about delivering environmental flows but it's to support a variety of ecosystems. And so, you know, in the past I, I was that vegetation nerd, but now it is the more holistic ecosystems that we need to be thinking about and protecting into the future. Well, it seems like a very good way to end. It's a hugely topical issue for Northern Australia, in particular with pressures coming on mm. the resources that we're all experiencing and that's a Hot topic now. Current research report on the real the drought hub up there as well. Yeah. So there's great concerns on uh, interest in this area as well. So I thank once again Tanya for coming along today, coming up to visit us in general, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. I'll be back. And we'll hopefully see a lot more over the next three years. So yep. if you put your hands together and do it online as well. Thank you all for a very impressive roll-up online. Thank so you so much. That's Hannah, fantastic. Hannah will be thrilled at the turnout. Well done, everybody. Nice. And you got a great show as a result. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. See you next more next Friday morning. <laughs> Turning off. It just pressed. Yeah. And we could